Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. In this video and the next few videos, we're going to be doing overviews of drugs that affect the endocrine system. And so in this video, we're going to be looking at drugs that are used to treat diabetes. Now, obviously, insulin is probably the most well-known drug that's used to treat diabetes. That's going to be covered in a later video. Right now, we're going to look at all the other drugs besides insulin. Now, in diabetes mellitus, both type 1 and type 2, one of the major issues that we see is elevated blood glucose because insulin is not functioning for whatever reason. Either there's decreased amounts of insulin or there's decreased sensitivity to that insulin. And so we see higher levels of blood glucose. So as we go through this video, what you should see is that, albeit through different mechanisms, these drugs are ultimately going to attempt to lower blood glucose. Let's start with the biguanides, and the major biguanide that's most common is metformin. So the biguanides are the only drugs here that are used as a first line of treatment against diabetes. More specifically, when somebody gets a new diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, normally the person will not go on insulin immediately. Normally what will happen is they'll do two things. One, they'll take a biguanide like this. And number two, they'll attempt to change lifestyle factors. So exercise, diet, things like that. And if that's unsuccessful for whatever reason, then perhaps uh, insulin therapy will be considered. But this is the only one that's a first line of treatment. All the other drugs we're going to see are considered either second lines of treatment or they are adjuvant therapies. Okay, so they're used in conjunction with other things to help uh, further control the diabetes. Now, biguanides like metformin have really two areas where they act. The first is up here at the liver. So the liver is going to perform gluconeogenesis. It can also perform glycogenolysis, but in any case, both of those processes are going to result in increased amounts of blood glucose. Recall that gluconeogenesis is a pathway by which we can take things like pyruvate or amino acids and so forth, and we can convert them into glucose, and so it elevates blood glucose. Well, that's a problem in diabetes, right? We don't want blood glucose to be so high, we want to lower it. And so what metformin will do is it will actually inhibit these processes within the liver that raise blood glucose. And so if we inhibit gluconeogenesis, then we're not going to have as much glucose being dumped into the blood. This helps lower blood glucose. The other areas that biguanides act is really at the level of these cells, like skeletal muscle. Uh, skeletal muscle is not the only kind, but really in general, every other type of peripheral cell. And these cells have to use glucose. And the way that they get this glucose is from the blood. And glucose is moved across the membrane of these cells, into the cells, by this transporter called GLUT4. It stands for Glucose Transporter 4. And ultimately what biguanides are also able to do is they're able to, through different mechanisms, really stimulate this glucose uptake by cells. And what this allows is, first of all, the cells are able to better utilize glucose, which is a problem in type 2 diabetes because the, the insulin receptor has lost sensitivity to insulin. And then also it removes that glucose from the blood. What did we say a problem with diabetes is? high blood glucose or hyperglycemia. So by removing the glucose, uh, by moving it into cells that utilize it, it removes glucose from the blood and helps to lower blood glucose. So hopefully that makes sense. The next class of drugs functions very similarly to the biguanides, and those are the thiazolidinediones, which for obvious reasons are abbreviated the TZDs. You can see a couple examples here, Actos, Avandia, and again, at the level of the liver, they inhibit these processes that uh, produce glucose and dump it into the blood. Okay? Uh, so for example, inhibiting this process of gluconeogenesis. So these drugs, if they inhibit this process, again, they're preventing glucose from being dumped into the blood. There's already enough glucose in the blood. There's too much of it, right? So we need to lower it. So inhibit this process. And again, at the level of the peripheral cells right here, they also help to stimulate glucose uptake uh, by these cells, okay, in the same way that the biguanides do. Okay, so very similar in their function, but they are a very different class of drugs. The third class of drug is what we call a second-generation sulfonylurea. 
This, along with the next class that we'll see, are the two major secretagogues. A secretagogue is a drug that, in this context, stimulates the pancreas to release insulin, or secrete insulin. That's why it's called a secretagogue. And that's the main function of the sulfonylureas. So here's our pancreas. Here's a couple cell types. These are the alpha cells, which release glucagon, the antagonist to insulin. And then right here, we have the beta cells. The beta cells release insulin. But in particular, with type 1 diabetes, uh, there's insufficient insulin that's produced and released. That's the major issue. And so as long as the patient still has some viable beta cells left, the sulfonylureas will act at that level and stimulate the beta cells to produce more insulin. So we get more insulin into the blood, and then insulin is going to allow more of these transporters to be embedded in the membrane of cells like skeletal muscle. This is called insulin-dependent glucose uptake. Okay? And so with more insulin, we have more of these transporters and more glucose uptake by these cells. Again, these cells are going to be better able to utilize glucose, but also it removes that glucose from the blood. So hopefully that makes sense. Now, it's not completely understood, but the sulfonylureas are also thought to be able to act with the biguanides over here and directly uh, stimulate glucose uptake by these uh, peripheral cells Okay, in the same way as the biguanides, but that's not for sure. What is known for a fact is that they're secretagogues. They stimulate insulin release by the beta cells. And then we have the second class of drugs, which are secretagogues, and those are the megalotinides. You can see those right here. Again, function very similarly to the sulfonylureas. They are secretagogues, and they stimulate the beta cells of the pancreas to release more insulin. Again, big concept. The more insulin we have, the more of these transporters we're going to have in the membrane and peripheral cells, and the better that they're going to be able to uptake glucose and utilize that glucose. Then we have another class of drugs here. These are not secretagogues. Uh, these are DPP-4 inhibitors, also called glyptins. Now, before we go into this, we need to understand a little bit about these molecules called incretins. So, incretins are molecules that act on the pancreas. They're normal molecules that we have in our body, normally produced. And what they tend to do is inhibit alpha cells, and they stimulate beta cells. So let's think about that for a second. Alpha cells release glucagon, and glucagon actually increases blood glucose. So incretins are good in this sense for diabetes, right? Because they inhibit glucagon, but they stimulate the beta cells, which would produce insulin. And that's what we want. We want more insulin so that way we can get glucose into peripheral cells, right? The problem is, is that incretins are degraded like anything else. And there's a couple enzymes here. Uh, the first one is DPP4. There's another one called NEP. It's not really important. But it degrades these incretins, which are proteins, just into degradation products that are no longer active. So uh, what we can do is we can prolong the existence of these incretins. And the way we do that is we inhibit the enzyme that degrades them. Right? So if this DPP4 is inhibited, then these incretins will stay around longer. They'll be able to inhibit glucagon release longer, and they'll be able to stimulate insulin release longer, which is good, especially in someone who has type 1 diabetes. Here's a zoomed in picture of what we just talked about. We've got the incretins up here. Here's that degradation pathway. Here's the DPP4 inhibitors, which prolong the existence of these incretins. And what you can see here is that on the alpha cells and the beta cells, um, the incretins, of course, are going to have to exert their effects by binding to receptors. Now, this is not the technical name of the receptor. It's not just called an incretin receptor. Okay, But the point is, is that the incretins are going to have to exert their effects by binding to receptors. So what we can do is actually use drugs that either inhibit this receptor or stimulate this receptor to increase available insulin. And so these are called GLP-1 receptor agonists. So GLP-1 is one type of incretin. And so in the context of GLP-1, these receptors would be called GLP-1 receptors, right? Well, we can use an agonist of those receptors. And so these are what we call incretin mimetics. And here's three examples of these right here. Uh, one of these that I've actually seen advertised on TV is Victoza. I've actually seen this one in particular. But in any case, these GLP-1 receptor agonists, uh, they're going to inhibit this receptor on alpha cells, just like incretins normally would. And by inhibiting alpha cells, well, you get release of less glucagon, right? But they also stimulate the GLP-1 receptors on beta cells, just like the incretins like GLP-1 would normally do. And by stimulating the beta cells, you get release of more insulin. 
Okay, so this is another way that we can cause increased production of insulin. Now for this class of drugs, I need to explain a little bit more. So we normally think of the beta cells as releasing insulin, and they do. But technically, insulin is co-released with another hormone that we don't normally talk about, and that hormone is called amylin. Okay? So amylin is a hormone that will go to certain cells and it'll bind to an amylin receptor like you see here. And when amylin binds to its receptor on particular cells, it overall just decreases postprandial glucose. Postprandial means after a meal. So of course, when you normally eat a meal, your blood glucose gets elevated, right? And that's a problem in people with diabetes, especially if it's not controlled well. And so by amylin binding to its receptor, we get delayed gastric emptying. Uh, suppressed glucagon release after a meal, and suppressed appetite by acting at the level of the central nervous system. And so it would make sense that because these things are good for people with diabetes, we'd have a drug that actually mimics the effects of amylin. Those would be the amylin mimetics. And so these drugs act as agonists of the amylin receptor. So hopefully that makes sense. Now everything that we talked about up to this point really has to do with either the liver the pancreas, or acting at the level of peripheral cells. There is one type of drug that we're going to talk about now that acts at the level of the kidneys, in particular at the proximal convoluted tubule. So here's your kidney right here, right? And within the kidney, we have these nephrons. And you've got various parts. You've got the glomerulus right here. Here's your proximal convoluted tubule. You've got your loop of Henle, distal convoluted tubule, and your collecting ducts, right? We'll remember that really at any level, of the nephron, we have these processes, tubular secretion and tubular reabsorption. So over here on the left, this is the blood, and over here on the right, this is actually the filtrate, which eventually becomes the urine. So anything that stays in this yellow part over here, the filtrate, will basically be eliminated through the urine via the kidneys. And these cells right here are the cells that make up the walls of the ductwork of this nephron. And so remember, tubular secretion, or just secretion, is the process by which we move something from the blood into the filtrate. So secretion would be how we get rid of something. But then there's also tubular reabsorption, or just reabsorption, and this goes the opposite direction. It moves something from the filtrate back into the blood. So this would not get rid of it. This would actually spare it or save it. Now normally when the glomerulus filters blood, it filters glucose, just like it does with every other small molecule. So initially going into these tubules, you will have glucose. However, normally we don't want to get rid of glucose. So pretty much all of the glucose is reabsorbed into the blood. So it follows this direction from the filtrate into the blood. And this process is facilitated normally by a transporter right here, and this is called SGLT2. It's a co-transporter for glucose and sodium. So when this is functioning in the proximal convoluted tubule, it moves these two substances together uh, from, the, from the filtrate back into the blood. And so this allows uh, glucose to be reabsorbed, because normally we don't want glucose going into the urine. We want to spare it, right? But in someone with diabetes, they have hyperglycemia, and so it may actually be of benefit to secrete that glucose, or at least prevent its reabsorption. So that way, you get rid of some of the glucose via the kidneys, and it just ends up in the urine. So we have a class of drugs here called SGLT2 inhibitors. These are drugs that inhibit this transporter. So if you think about the transporter's normal function, it helps with the reabsorption of glucose. If you inhibit this transporter, the glucose will actually stay in the filtrate and it will fail to be reabsorbed by the proximal convoluted tubule, which is really the only area where any glucose is reabsorbed. So once it gets past this into the loop of Henle, it's pretty much destined for elimination in urine. And so this can be a way to get rid of some of the glucose that's in the blood when it's in excess, is inhibit this transporter. So one of the obvious effects here is that you get increased glucose excretion in the urine, but this can actually help with weight loss uh, because you're losing potential calories, right? Glucose isn't being burned in glycolysis. It's not being stored away as body fat. It's being eliminated, right? And this can be especially beneficial in someone with type 2 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes, weight loss is normally not an issue. Um, normally with type 1 diabetes, uh, people will often be underweight, at least initially. In type 2 diabetes, obesity is much more of an issue. And so that weight loss via this caloric loss through the urine can be of benefit to those individuals. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the major drugs other than insulin that impact diabetes and understand where in basic metabolism and physiology 
they affect. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.